Okay, so it's uh, already five minutes after the hour. So let's uh, start this. Welcome, everyone. We're very glad to have you in the second session on discussing an, um, the reporting consolidation of SOEs as part of the general finances of the government. Um, as I mentioned before, and I will mention again, for, okay, for the translation, you're gonna see a globe that's on the bottom part where you can see the participants logo. So it's kind of like a globe. If you click on that one, you're gonna see French or English translation. Okay, I hope you see it now. Let us know in the chat in case you have any questions. You should be able to, to hear us in French and English now. Um, so as I mentioned last time, so last Tuesday, uh, this part of SOEs has come to the attention or most of the relevance on the fiscal openness accelerator project because of the caveats that it has. It's complex uh, from the identification to the consolidation. It's not usually as straightforward and has a lot of uh, challenges that have been historical and ongoing. So we decided to have this these three sessions on reporting of SOEs. I'm going to just share a bit here of the slides to give you a bit of context. So as you know, we are doing this, uh, these three sessions of reporting of SOEs as part of the Fiscal Openness Accelerator project that we have from IVP through uh, GIFT. And we're doing this in collaboration with Cabri. We're very happy to have Cabri here. And this is supported by the USA department. I think they're already also connected and we're very happy to have you because this is a very important topic to discuss. And we think uh, the, or what we have received as comments from last session is that this discussion is very useful. Sometimes it's not recognized enough or it's omitted and we jump into the fiscal risks, but don't discuss the reporting of the SOE. So, we wanted to go uh, into this complex topic and give it the relevance that it deserves. So for the sessions last uh, Tuesday, we have the framing session of SOEs reporting in the context of fiscal transparency and the FOA countries. Um, when I say FOA, it's the fiscal openness accelerator con uh, countries. Uh, today we're in session two about information flows for reporting SOEs transactions with government, including integration through FMIS. So why this? Because if we don't have good information flows, then our transparency is going to be faulty. And we can only go as a, so far with transparency as much as the information that governments have internally. If you don't have the information, then what kind of transparency can we have? And we had the added problem of a, having the comprehensiveness or faulty integration of the information, a lot of gaps. And this will uh, also have uh, challenges in the, in the transparency area. And finally, session three is gonna be on reporting and management of guarantees. So then we're gonna focus the third session only on guarantees to SOEs and the link with fiscal risk. So finally, on the third session, we're gonna look at, at the, the issue of reporting and how this can have uh, problems with fiscal risk or create fiscal risk. So that's the agenda for last session. As you can remember, we discussed um, the progress that has been going on in, in some of your countries. Uh, we didn't have a Benedict fully, and I think we have him here today. I think I saw, saw you here. So we would be very glad to hear you as well, the progress that has been going on in Liberia. We commented about it. I actually showed uh, in some of the slides the, the report of Liberia and AFRITAC uh, West 2 also shared that there's a lot of progress going on and some of the challenges that, that Liberia is facing. We had the Nigeria, we're gonna have them again today. I'm gonna show you what. Um, it, we had a bit of issues with connection in Benin, but we did have um, some, some insights of Benin. And we had Senegal and Cameroon also with updates on how this is going. We were very glad to have Cameroon that it's not a, fork, a fiscal openness accelerator country, 
but is joining us in this session. Finally, we had a, a discussion on public sector balance sheets, a topic that has been coming up lately in the fiscal transparency agenda and in general in the public financial management agenda. And we need to take a better look at the integration of um, public operations in public sector balance sheets. So that was uh, for last time for last session on Tuesday. As I mentioned uh, last time, we recorded the session and we're going to make it available for you because we know that some of you are in in a budget process in discussions. So you can have it both in French and in English. So we're going to have the two recordings, and we're going to share them with you. For today, for today we have a very interesting agenda as well. Uh, I'm just doing uh, some welcome remarks, and we can jump right to it because we have um, the view of the SOE's health check uh, by Phoebe Hira from the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF. We're gonna discuss about gaps in reporting, monitoring, and reporting of reliable and comprehensive transactions of SOEs. We're gonna have enough time for question and answer. Um, Let's let's uh, enjoy that we have CV here to make a lot of questions, and then we're going to discuss some on work, uh, ongoing work on information flows and integration issues with Cabri. Cabri is doing a lot of work around FMIS, and as you as I mentioned before, FMIS are very important if we want to have good transparency that is actually sustainable. So the recording and gathering of information takes a, a big roles here. And finally, we're having two country examples of what is going on and how they are working on integrating better uh, the state-owned enterprises. That's the case of South Africa. And thank you, Sheila. We know you're in budget discussions right now. So we're very happy to have you. And Nigeria, since we discussed about the FMIS on, on Tuesday, and they're going to share more in detail with us. So with that, and I want to be brief so that I can pass you the word, Stevie, right now. The floor is gonna be all yours. Um, so Stevie Hira from the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMS. Okay, thank you, Lorena. Hello, everybody. I hope you and your loved ones are well at this difficult period of time. So, I'm going to discuss, as Lorena explained, the SOE health check tool that the uh, Fiscal Affairs Department has developed recently. So let me allow me to share my slides. So I'm not able to remember everything without slides, so I will ask the help of the slides. Okay, thank you. So before I start, I want you to, just one second, I can. Okay, okay, you can see it now, yeah? Okay, before I start, I would like to, to pose the questions to you. So I provide here two country, country and country B with an SOE sector. Uh, one has liabilities about uh, above 60% and the country B has liabilities about 30%. And my question is, which central government would face larger fiscal risk from the SOE sector? So the country that has more liabilities or the countries that has less liabilities owned by SOEs. So of course you can say that this question is not fair because we need more information. And yet I provide you the total assets. So still you can see that both countries, the total assets compared with the liabilities, I'm talking about the SOE sector, are almost twice their liability. So still it's difficult Maybe? to find out. Maybe we're not seeing the slides move. Really? We are not seeing the slides move. Maybe, uh, can you click again on the presentation icon? Yeah, here? No. Can you see it now? We're seeing the, the PowerPoint, uh, but it's on the um, um, front page only on the cover. Really? Okay. Here. And you go. Maybe escape and then again click on the okay, on this presentation. Or otherwise, I can share it for you if it's 
Yeah, let's see once again. So, okay. 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 Sorry about that. Mm. No? Still not? Um, we were seeing a black screen, but now we're back on the slides mode, like normal, not presentation mode of PowerPoint. This one worked, just so you know that you will need to move like one by one. Sorry? Um, now you're on the second slide. Okay. Yeah, Okay. but it's not in presentation mode, just so you know. Oh, it's not in presentation. I, I think I put that in presentation. Yeah, probably something. Is it now? No. I think we can work with this. Um, I think we can, we can work with this because we're seeing your slide and the next one. Okay. Right, fine. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. So I don't know. No I see problem. here in my, okay. Okay. So we are discussing about which country or which central government can face a larger fiscal risk from state owned enterprises sector. So especially the, the country that has higher uh, liabilities in terms of percent of GDP, that is twice than the other country. So we'll discuss that. Uh, just keep keep your answer to yourself and we'll see again at the end of the presentation using uh, the feature of the uh, SOE health check tool that IMF has developed, our fiscal affairs department has developed. But before, so just what I'm going to discuss, I'm going to discuss very briefly about why we should worry about the fiscal risks from SOEs. I think we discussed last time, so um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you are aware of problems that comes from SOE, so we don't want to spend much time about that, understanding their risk and assessing fiscal risk, fiscal risk from state-owned enterprises. And I'll spend more time on the tool that the Fiscal Affairs Department has developed and how we can use the tool to answer that question or other questions that are very important for for officials in the Ministry of Finance, especially those that uh, deal with fiscal risks and especially budget people at the end of the day, they have to take care of the risks that can be material, they are materialized by, from SOEs. So not to lose time. So I think why worry about fiscal risk? I think we discussed uh, last time, there were, uh, I think the colleague from uh, Cabri explained in detail what, uh, how big are SOEs, what kind of uh, uh, effect they have in economy in terms of uh, supporting the economy. But when they are, they are in, in trouble, they bring costs for the economy. So I'm not going to spend much time here. So I think you are aware of that. And we know that they cover a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, economic activity in a country, employ a lot of uh, uh, people, so uh, they can bring a huge risk for the government. So I think uh, what another thing that I would say is that, or let's say the benefits of financial crisis in 2008 for, uh, for central governments and even for the IMF is that they taught us that other sectors outside the central government are very important and we have to consider and to analyze and monitor them daily or be sure be be aware of their costs that can bring to the government so uh, for because of that crisis we saw that the bailouts uh, after that there was a lot of analysis to discuss what this crisis brought uh, and affected uh, soes performance, but not only this crisis, but after that, how big has been uh, bailouts of the central government or SOEs. And you can see that from this uh, uh, chart, which is very, very difficult to understand from here, but you will find that in IMF uh, fiscal risk uh, paper published, and I've put the links uh, at the end of this presentation, is about 3% of GDP. And also there are direct relationship between the SOEs and the budget here, there is a chart 
by a, a paper published recently by our colleague, uh, which shows for uh, there is a chart from Tanzania and Benin when SOE sector uh, receives quite a lot of money from the budget uh, in in about two percent in 2014. 1.5% 1, 1 of GDP in 2016. And also you can see that SOEs for both countries, Benin and Tanzania, receive more money from the government they, they bring uh, to the government, which in fact should be the reverse because SOEs are, are operating the assets of the government. So this is very important. I think uh, you know you work every day on a budget and know how costly uh, are SOEs for the budget and discussion you have when you prepare the budget. So another interesting fact of SOEs uh, and analyzing the fiscal risk is not only uh, focused directly on the cost to the government, but also to understand why some SOEs are doing are performing well and some are not, because at the end of the day we know the cost would be on taxpayers. So that's a very interesting chart here also uh, published in the note, uh, in a how to note from the uh, Fiscal Affairs Department, still the link is the end of this presentation. And you can, so, uh, you can show the airlines in Africa have very different performance. So one of the airlines, Ethiopia airline is doing very well and others not. The question is why? And I think that's another question, uh, another, uh, interesting fact or a work that should be done by uh, of, uh, experts in the in the Ministry of Finance to understand that. Of course, there could be a lot of issues, quasi fiscal activities, etc. But what is important is understanding SOEs uh, is, is very helpful for the Ministry of Finance uh, to to make sure that the money goes where it should go. So. Fiscal risk from SOEs, I think already we talked about that. They have direct impact, lower, uh, lower less dividend, more transfers from the central government or taxpayers' money to the SOEs, uh, lo larger loans, which can uh, bring a future cost for the government, et cetera, indirect impact on fiscal indicators, uh, poor operational performance and underinvestment in infrastructure, because if we have poor SOEs, of course, that will impact the public sector assets. And of course, as we talked last, last time about the public sector balance sheet, uh, SOEs are part of the public sector. And if they perform bad, that of, of course will uh, reflect in infrastructure of the public sector in a country and also in the quality of life and economic growth. I'm going so fast here because I think we discussed last time, but please, if uh, you have any question, we can discuss that again at the end of the presentation or now. So I think this is a kind of uh, summary of what I said. So SOEs have a multi-factor, multi multi-faced uh, faces the uh, effect in, a, in economy directly to the government, but also in other sectors that uh, affects the overall economy. So now the question is, okay, we know the SOEs are, are an issue, are a big problem. We, we know that uh, SOEs are, are there and they operate the asset of the government. What we know, what we have to do is how to make sure that we monitor them properly. Uh, we support them when they, they need and how we to make sure that we will not bring any cost for the government in the future. So of course, one, the first step is information. Uh, SOEs has to provide information, to publish information. In my experience, I think I have worked more, more than in 15 countries covering these topics the one of the big problems is SOEs don't produce financial statements and don't publish in the websites. Even meeting with uh, SOEs, they say, okay, we're, when we have asked for the information, financial statements, they say, okay, it is published in the website and you go to the website and it doesn't work. And I don't think that sometimes this is by accident. So I think the first thing is providing that information. And in most countries, the legal system is there. So 
the legal system asks SOEs to produce these financial statements in the website, sent to the Ministry of Finance, et cetera, or other institution, but it's very difficult. Anyway, so if we don't have information, I think uh, it's very difficult, difficult to, to, to go further. But for those cases, we, when we have information, and we'll discuss later on, and uh, it doesn't mean that because sometimes you don't have the human capacity to cover all the SOEs, or, but it doesn't mean that you have to go to each SOE line by line. If you can classify SOEs from, let's say, the biggest uh, SOEs that can be different because of risks, because of uh, social impact they have in economy or economic impact. For example, an, an electricity company is very difficult for the central government to let it without uh, monitoring, because at the end of the day, if something happens to the electricity sector, of course, will impact the economy and will impact, uh, will uh, force the government to intervene. So, as I said, the first information, the second is how to analyze this information. And uh, well, usually, the only, let's say, the quick and uh, let's say the quickest way to analyze SOEs, especially when you are sitting in the Ministry of Finance, is to use financial ratio, uh, ratio analysis. So this is a kind of uh, the same the private sector use. So I don't think, uh, and most of the SOEs operate uh, to produce profits. So there is no uh, other way to say why not to use this, uh, this kind of analysis. So you assess the performance and the risk of uh, SOEs, profit, 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 profitability, solvency and liquidity, and see if these three indicators are performing well or, or not. So, and I think there is no any a rock of science here, so it's very simple to do this kind of analysis. Just the first thing, as I said, to collect information, to identify relations with the government, taxes and dividends. Sometimes it's very important. Subsidies, loans, contingent liabilities, guarantees, arrears, because there are a lot of other information that are very important to, for SOEs. For example, we have found that some SOEs look they perform very well, uh, even they have high profit. But when you analyze further, what we have found, we have found that, let's say, the government has providing them a lot of transfers. So, and now the CEO of that uh, SOE, he, he, he gives a big speech at the end of the fiscal year and said, this year we did a lot of, we had a larger profit than last year, but if you remove this, the government's transfers, it will be in a loss. So it's very important to go underneath those, uh, uh, let's say, big numbers that are provided by SOEs. And especially for the central government, this is, very, is uh, crucial to analyze because uh, at the end of the day, the, these are taxpayers' money that uh, have moved from one sector to another. And composite uh, risk indicators, like for, for example, Altman Z-score, which uh, is a combination of the uh, financial ratios and provide an indicator if the company is doing well or not. But as I said, this is the first step. Don't, uh, don't, uh, don't stop at financial ratios because financial ratios can cover a lot of other informations that are very important. Then you can move on, especially if you have identified those, uh, those SOEs that are important, are big, they can be in terms of uh, liabilities or assets or in terms of uh, uh, fiscal cost to the government or big to the economy, then you can analyze them in detail. And what uh, we have produced also at the Fiscal Affairs Department, and you'll see in the paper that I have uh, I have linked, uh, I provided a link, we have developed a stress testing. So what would happen uh, with, uh, with the financial performance of, of this SOE or that SOE if something bad ha happened in the future. So it's a kind of, of, kind of uh, stress test that uh, com a commercial bank do, but you can do that for each uh, SOE. For example, let's say an airline company. So what happened if the, uh, uh, the price of oil 
uh, moves up again. So let's say twice, then it's now, or let's say it goes back to the price of two or three years ago. So this kind of uh, uh, analysis are very important. Then you have other, other quantitative analysis, as I said, benchmarking to peers. For example, I, I just showed you the chart from the note when the two, company, two, uh, two airlines uh, we're, do we're not doing well. One of the airlines were doing uh, pretty well. So the question is why? So the same industry, the same, uh, uh, let's say, issues they face because they are from the same region, etc. So, and as I said, we have to go in detail, deeper analysis of key sources of risks, so revenue, cost, debt composition, effect of the exchange rate, etc and qualitative analysis. So there are a lot of other information that, uh, so these are kind of steps you have to follow when you discuss the SOEs. As I said, you start from financial ratios, very rough, then you go in detail. And it doesn't mean that you have to spend, to go to each SOEs, even that SOEs is, which is small. It, I don't think it's worth spending much time. So you have to spend this time, especially on qualitative analysis, which requires more information and uh, 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 direct relationship sometimes with the SOEs to analyze and see if the SOEs is, is doing a good job or not. So as I said, so we were going to the health check tool that we, we discussed. So the idea is, as I said, to link the financial ratios, ratios with, uh, with the fiscal risks. So we know lower dividends and taxes, so uh, are, are kind of fiscal risk for the government from SOE sector and how we can get the indicate, which, which is the indicator from SOEs is deteriorating in profitability ratios. So if the company doesn't, uh, does poorly in profit, it means that they're not going to pay dividends or taxes. Or if, if their profit is going in minus, it means that maybe they are going to ask for transfer. So it's another risk for, for the government. Or sometimes the government is forced to intervene with equity. So because they are insolvent, so they can't serve their debt, so the government has to intervene. And we have seen that, that in many, many countries, almost in all countries, I would say, when the government intervenes to, to provide equity to, to their SOEs or they will ask for more loans or kind of, uh, so they have problem with liquidity, they can go to the, to the commercial banks to get to, to borrow. And sometimes commercial bank, we ask for guarantees. So which could be a risk for the government in the future. Or if the government has kind of guaranteed their loans or other, or, uh, other projects, and they are not able to pay, that it means that this is a materialization of contingent liabilities of SOEs, which means the government has to intervene. So you can see there is a kind of parallel between uh, fiscal risk and, uh, and financial ratios. They can give a, a kind of good, good proxy for fiscal risk for the government if, if we analyze that. And I still bring again the question I had at the beginning. So when I said which uh, country will face more, more problems in the future, country that has an SOE sector with a huge uh, uh, liability or the one that has half of that liabilities as a percent of GDP, you will see that. So the SOE health check tool. So based, so as I said, So, so we, so we know now that, as I said, SOEs are important. Yeah. So, uh, and we know that we can use financial ratios as a proxy of uh, of fiscal risk materialization. So, based on that, and the work the fiscal affairs department has done in in many countries, we came up uh, with the tool which is very simple tool in Excel. 
we are still working to finalize it. And uh, since uh, I think in the last two, two months, uh, Fiscal Affairs Department uh, is working on a fiscal risk framework. We'll uh, soon, after we finalize all these uh, tools that we have produced, we'll publish them in the website as other uh, capacity development uh, information we have produced which will be called Fiscal Risk Framework uh, uh, Corner at the IMF website. But anyway, so the tool, as I said, is in Excel, provides the comp compilation of data for 40 SOEs for over a period of up to 15 years. So, and I think 40 SOEs are quite a, a large number of SOEs. So if, if a country has more than 40 SOEs, Maybe you can have two kind of because, as I said, it's in Excel. You can do forty for in one uh, in one uh, in one file, and you can do others in another file. Or I think maybe with some tricks you can expand that also. Computes a set of financial ratios based on income statement and balance sheet information. As I said, the first thing important is information. So without that, you can do nothing. So but they, the tool will produce all financial ratios, assigns an overall risk rating. So as I said, because there is a parallel between financial ratios and fiscal risks. So now based on financial ratios, the tool assign a risk, let's say which is low, is high or medium, we'll see that later. Uh, and identifies SOEs with the largest outstanding liabilities as an indication of the government's risk exposure. So that the tool identifies which are the companies that can be can pose a higher risk for the larger risk for the government in the future based on uh, liabilities they have. Uh, produces aggregate charts and indicators that allow an assessment of the financial soundness of the SOE sector as a whole. So it, it doesn't go only by SOE by SOE, but for overall sector, how it has performed in the last, let's say, five years or 15 years. So you can analyze and see if the SOE sector is going in the right direction or in the wrong direction. Provides ratios and charts to enable an in-depth analysis of individual SOEs. So for each SOEs, you can produce a lot of charts, which means that you link a kind of a, uh, link financial ratios with possibility of a fiscal risk. And here you can identify which are, let's say, uh, the sickest SOEs, then they need maybe they need they need monitoring or maybe they need to go to, to see the doctor. So since we are talking about health check, so how can the analysis analysis be used? So as I said, all this information is produced by the tool. So estimates likelihood of risk realization and associated fiscal costs. So that, that can be can help. You can base on that information the tool produce. You can do that, and you can use because it provides a lot of information by each SOEs and the whole SOE sector and interesting graphs. You can inform policymakers which SOEs is uh, is more requires more inter, in, intense monitoring and actions by the central government. And as I said, because it produced some interesting charts, it's very easy also to be understood by policymakers, which are not experts on financial ratios. ratios. Mm. Of course, as I said, uh, the tool can't, uh, is, it's very simple. It doesn't go to detail in every every line of the financial statements. We just go to the to the biggest uh, to the largest uh, information that we need from financial statements and balance sheets. So minimizes intensive data manipulation and automatically calculate ratios and, pr and pr produce charts. This kind of phase in Excel. And what is uh, another important of the tool? which I think I have used for one country when I produced the uh, work with authorities to produce public sector balance sheet. We use this tool to, to import the data of the SOE sector to the public sector balance sheet, because uh, I think Jason mentioned last, uh, last presentation, the SOE sector is very important uh, 
part of the public sector balance sheet. And based on that information, we can directly uh, in, uh, import those data to the public sector balance sheet database. So, as I said, tool is designed for the analysis of non-financial public corporations. Uh, the, as, as I said at, at the beginning, so when I talked about stress test, uh, which kind of uh, mirrors that stress test in commercial banks, so the tool is not, it's good, you, you can use the tool to collect data even for for financial uh, financial uh, sector financial corporation, but it's not that good to analyze banks because, as you know, uh, commercial banks have a different uh, different uh, uh, behavior than uh, non-financial public corporation, and usually, uh, the central banks in each country has has a kind of a kind of solid framework to analyze and to stress test these banks. So. Uh, you have to be careful when you use these tools for commercial banks. Commercial, uh, yeah, commercial banks provides for a static analysis or both historical if information and and existing forward-looking projections. So the tool is not forward-looking, so based only on the past, on the information that is provided in balance sheet. But it doesn't mean that you can't use those information for future projection. Uh, So it doesn't, as I said, is is not uh, linked with uh, stress testing. Stress testing is, is a different tool, but some of this information can be is useful when you go to the second step, that is stress testing, because this is a kind of let's say the, the a check you have to do to all SOEs to see which one has to go to stress testing, and which one couldn't go. And the risk thresholds are applied across the SOE portfolio. Portfo Portfolio, so is the same because we'll, we'll, I'll explain later on how these uh, thresholds are built. Although the level of risk may vary by industry, so different industries have a different uh, kind of uh, uh, risks, and maybe uh, a ratio in one industry could be, let's say, in a telecommunication, could be different with utilities. So you have to be careful, but uh, I think that, that we'll see. Uh, the tool allows you to manipulate to change those ratios that I'll calculate. So you have to go in deep because the numbers are kind uh, uh, automatically produced, but especially those numbers that are kind of sensitive, you have to go in more detail to get more information. So uh, Siri, as I said, you have five minutes. Five minutes, good. Yeah. Okay. I just I wanted to ask. Sort of like, I wanted to yeah, as I said, we are working. So the tool is very simple. As I said, there are three main in Excel, three main uh, uh, worksheets. One is inputs when you put the old data based on uh, balances and financial statements. You have a calculation sheet which is done automatically, and you have the outputs. So these are the ratios used uh, used uh, by uh, by the tool. So then it has, which links the financial ratios with fiscal risk. If the fiscal risk is high or not, for example, let's say profitability, if uh, rate of return is less than minus 10%, it means that the, this company is in a high risk. So, but as I said, these are the ratios that is, is used in the tool. You can change them. So if you see that maybe the we can't accept a company to have a, a ratio minus minus ten percent, even that one that is minus two percent is a high risk. You can change that, so the tool allows you. So then this is the main input sheet. The input sheet when you could put all the data, the country, how many SOEs, which country you have. So it's a kind of you set up the tool, then you go and using financial uh, statements and balance sheets and put the, all the data in the input sheet. So uh, another, another feature of the tool is that not only financial data, but you, have, you can produce also government transactions. So guarantee that on lending loan, which are very important for further analysis. Then, so it produces after you, let's say, suppose you have put 15 SOEs, or here, in, in this case, the chart you show is there are 10 SOEs, then the, the tool automatically produces you a heat map, which says which company is in high risk, 
and uh, which uh, financial indicators shows that. As I said, because we link financial ratios with fiscal risk, and you can see uh, in uh, this case, I don't know which country is this, I can't remember, but there are a lot of red, which means that SOE sector is not doing well. So then it produced some other information for the whole sector, what's the con uh, total contingent liabilities, and you can see from this chart that I think more, uh, almost, let's say, six or seven companies make up up to 95% of the total liabilities of the whole SOE sector. Then, as I said, you produce the for the whole sector, let's say for five years, how the profitability has has gone, and you can see it's going down. This solvency, interest coverage, all these formation that are important for the whole SOE sector. Other information produces you which company is the higher risk, for example. So you have the names of companies, and you know you know now which company is really in a big trouble, and that you have to go and follow up with further analysis. And a single company, so you, you pick one of the companies you have in your data sheet and in a database, and that the tool produces you a, a lot of uh, information and charts, and that shows how the, the company has been doing during the last five years. Uh, as I said, produce a, a public sector balance sheet data, so automatically it converts uh, the IFRS uh, classification to GFS. You have to, to be careful here because in GFS, equity also is classified as liability. And so coming up to the question I had at the beginning, so this is a, the company A, which had the, the country A, sorry, which has 65% of GDP and liabilities. And you can see there are a lot of red here. And you can see that uh, most of this chart shows here, the red one, that around 70%, no, sorry, uh, SO is classified as high risk may up to 10.5% of GDP, which means 60.1% of GDP sector liabilities and a big trouble. So let's say the other company, this, this is the other one. And I think, yeah. I think this chart should be down, sorry. I think there's a misplacement of the chart, but 72% of SOEs are in a big trouble of 32% of companies, which means that 20, 23% of GDP of, uh, of liabilities are in a big trouble. So if you can see, I, I gave you the first chart, only liabilities. I gave you the second chart. It's very difficult, it seems that it's difficult to say, but. The second chart shows you that maybe these two countries are pretty equal because assets are quite twice their liabilities. But if you see these charts after you're doing analysis, you can see the country A, the liabilities that are in trouble with a high risk are only 10%. And country B with liabilities that are in trouble are 23%. So you can see that country B can pose larger risk to the central government because the liabilities which already are in trouble are, are twice than the country A. Even the country A has higher, its liabilities are twice than country B. So using those tools, you can see now that how you can, can uh, analyze the SOE sector. So, so these are the links. I think they're interesting papers that have been published recently. And, uh, and also the how to note from the uh, fiscal affairs department. A country that has a very interesting uh, uh, SOE report is Seychelles. Uh, uh, fiscal affairs department in Africa South has worked in the last uh, three, three years with Seychelles, and now they produce a very comprehensive uh, uh, SOE sector report, not only with the data, but they analyze also the fiscal risk for each uh, SOE. Okay, thank you. So maybe I was a little bit fast at the end, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. So if I was not clear. Thank you. Actually, I, you, we made it all of the time. So we have enough time for questions. We already have a question from uh, Jason. 
lacking, but I want to see also if our um, our colleagues from the region and the flag countries have uh, questions. I know that we have people that manage SOEs uh, are right here. So please make sure that you can ask the questions, raise your hand or write down. So I have one question, CB, uh, first, and I will give you the, the mic, Jason. Um, this tool, where is it available? The, 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 this Excel spreadsheet, is it possible to, is it available for, for all the countries here or should they contact the IMF? Okay, we are working bilaterally with uh, different countries using this tool. So the tool is not yet, we have piloting that in I think six countries already now or six or more countries, I think because I think different colleagues are working in different countries, but I know that uh, it's uh, being used uh, bilaterally. So we can, uh, uh, authorities can contact us directly, either through us directly, FID, FID or Africa West, uh, to an Afro, Africa West. So I think uh, uh, our colleagues are working for the fiscal risk framework uh, corner that will be published in the IMF website. I'm not sure, but it will be soon. I think uh, they, are, they, are, they are still working also with the tool they're preparing guidelines, explaining in detail, uh, much better than I explained it. So how the tool can be used, uh, what financial ratios means, how you can change financial ratios, every steps the tool can be useful. But uh, for now on, we, as I said, we are happy to, to support any any authorities, any uh, country that uh, are participating in this uh, session to, to work with them and help them and use the tool. Because as I said, if you see some of the charts there, there are some empty, so it, it requires some uh, other work you have to do, but it will be soon public. And, and I think there's a lot of work regarding the integration of all this information that the tool requires. So I am very glad that we're having this in this session when we're discussing information flows. Um, Jade, I see Jeannie Ga that you unmuted yourself. Do you want to say something as well? Let me know. And Jason. Yes. Um, hi. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks for the. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I just was wondering, you went quickly through the, those slides showing the, the different figures, but you had made the point that, you had made the point earlier that uh, if you look at uh, state corporations will make statements like we're highly profitable this year, but that's really, that's gross of government subsidies if you take out those subsidies. So I was just wondering in the chart you were showing, is that are those net of subsidies from like, like if it, you have a chart on profitability, is that net of government subsidies or, or the tool allows you to look at it both ways or how, uh, what are we, what were we looking at? Uh, the charts I showed ha are real uh, figures from uh, uh, two countries that I've worked. So I, those, I don't think they are cleared because the data were not uh, that detailed. So just we use that First, just to collect the data and create a database and then do some analysis. But uh, on these charts, they are not removed. So as I said, there's a lot of work you have to, to do beyond this, uh, these numbers. Some countries, uh, in, in, in one country, we were able to, to remove those information, but in, in another country, we, we couldn't because we didn't have that uh, information. And sometimes we just collect it and uh, uh, even through the PDF uh, documents from financial statements. Okay, please uh, ask for the information and no PDFs. <laughs> so, and guess we are, we are uh, spreading the word of no PDFs, please. And let's if there, um, we have seen in some of your reports of the people here on the budget documents that it's not just PDFs, but scanned PDFs which poses a very big challenge on the use of the information. I have another question from Johan. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so with our experience working in uh, Africa, um, in the region, 
different regions. Um, what we experience is that, yeah, data is sometimes a problem. Um, the institutional arrangements sometimes are weak. Um, and, and, and capacity to analyze these, these data are sometimes not, not, not there. Um, so from, uh, if you now from a, uh, look at the country uh, from a very basic perspective, uh, how could they start um, uh, in, uh, before they get into stress testing and all these uh, sometimes complicated uh, 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 tools? Uh, what could you recommend a country? How can the country start and what can they do to, uh, to analyze on, from a very basic perspective? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. That's, I think that this is an interesting question. And uh, as you said, I had the experience working with the different countries and asking the, this question. I think that first of all is the information, but uh, as you said, some countries don't have the capacity. The health tool is a kind of, let's say a help. Of course, it, it, it requires some capacity, but it doesn't mean that, let's say, maybe if someone is good in Excel and can collect the information, he can produce or she can produce those information that can be easily read by others. It doesn't mean that you have to have, let's say, a team of 10, 10 experts uh, to do this kind of analysis because the tool is very simple and uh, it doesn't mean that you have to have uh, all details information. It would, do, it would be good to have it, but as the second best, I think you can produce some very interesting information that can be a good proxy of which SOEs is a kind of uh, in, in a risk, is in trouble, then you can follow up with other information. So, so the first thing I would say, collect the information, I tell you, for example, I have worked in one country that have put all the data one by one going to the PDF and, and fill the, the, the database. Another good thing, which I think with this uh, tool is it creates a database. So maybe it, it would be a little bit difficult at the beginning when you, let's say you put the data for three years, last three years, but then it will be every year you just work a little bit, you, you put some data every year when the financial statements are produced, and uh, then you can do analysis, analysis. Second or third, I would say that don't bother to go to every small SOEs in country. Of course, it's good to have that information. I'm not saying not to do that, but focus on big SOEs that can really be a big trouble for the government. And this SOE, SOE to health check tool is produced in behalf of the Minister of Finance. So to help the Minister of Finance or people that deal with fiscal risk in a government. So it's not a tool for management of SOEs. It's a tool to make sure that the government is not caught uh, unexpected when a risk hits uh, the government. So I think, yeah, it, the tool, it, it's, it's very simple. It's not, it's not very complicated. So it's just an Excel, put the data, and you'll, you'll produce some very interesting information then you can follow up. Thank but, you, oh, Sibi. There's a lot of discussion in this. Oh. Thank you, Sibi. And actually, um, I wanted to also pass it to, to Ben. I think, Ben, you want to make a question yeah. or is it yeah, already I to ask passing to the mic? Okay. I wanted to ask a question to Sibi first, especially communicating the rigs. Uh, because what, uh, I think the IMF has helped us tremendously in Liberia uh, to assess the fiscal risks within SOE. But one of the things we have in difficulty is communicating, uh, uh, communica communicating the risk strategy to, the, to, to top management. So what we normally do, uh, if you're looking at our report, we have all the ratios and, and what have you in the report. But when it comes to advising the proper authority to take a stand on how to proceed with the SOEs, that's when it becomes difficult. So we don't communicate. <clears throat> All the risks that is in the Euro report, we try to analyze it and then advise the minister as to what approach to take. Because most of the SOEs have tremendous power, they have political leverage. And so it's very difficult. So how do you, like, how do we go about communicating uh, that risks 
uh, uh, an SOE that is having problems so everybody can be able to understand what's the situation with that particular SOE? Well, yeah, that's a kind of interesting question and in which I like it because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy to solve political problems or let's say the management problems with technical issues. But I think there is, there is a trick there. Transparency is a trick. It's, it makes it makes politician or a kind of force politician or policy makers to take measure. What I mean by that, I mean that when you produce all this information, you have to, to, to publish them. Make transparency that this SOE or these five SOEs are bringing a big risk to the government. So then policymakers will, will ha would have been more difficult not to take measure. And I, I, I say this based on my experience uh, working in my country, but also we when we work in Seychelles. Seychelles, Seychelles has, a, has the same problem. So then what the, the, uh, the enterprise or let's say the, uh, the department or the commission that covers the uh, uh, SOE's oversight did, they published all the information in detail. So in their website, sent to the government, even they had some problems that some SOE's couldn't respond, couldn't, didn't provide the information to them. And they just published it an empty page and said, this SOE's, uh, this SOE's didn't submit the financial statements to our commission. And next year was completely different. Those the, uh, SOEs were calling when it's deadline to submit this uh, fi this financial statement. So, so I agree that it's not easy. It's uh, not uh, in every country is different how to communicate that to policymakers. But I think one issue is publish. Be very clear when you publish uh, th this information and show how big uh, trouble the SOEs may bring to the government. And that I think can push. Uh, force policymakers to take that in consideration. And of course, you have to do the, all the, the normal work you do every day, communicate, coordinate with the budget department, with the debt department, with other departments are very important. But I, I think you do that. So, but for me, one of the solution is, uh, is transparency and be very clear and, you know, for example, and how you publish it is very, very important. So I think South Africa is one good example how how beautiful they they publish their their budget uh, documentation, medium-term budget framework, etc. Very nicely, they spend a lot of time how they have to say things and how to present in nice graphs. So, so that can have kind of influence. So so I think that is an example you can you can. Uh, use also from South Africa when they publish the budget documentations. So um, this, this part of seeing also transparency as a tool for transmitting a message that should be uh, reaching the inside um, to take action. So that, that's a, a great message. So now uh, I, I don't see any more questions. And I will pass you the word, uh, Ben, actually. Uh, we, we were not able to have him here last time. Um, so on Tuesday, so I would just have to give you five minutes then as, as uh, we were not as, as planned, but we're very happy to have you here. Uh, ben, let me introduce him. He's, he's from Liberia, from the Ministry of Finance, and there's a special unit for SOEs inside of the Ministry of Finance. And they're producing good reports. Actually, uh, CB, right now you were mentioning, I uh, didn't hear very well which uh, country that has these notes of when they don't receive the, the information. And actually, Liberia is doing that. Uh, I was quite impressed when I saw that. Of course, we can work on the um, presentation of the information. Um, as we always say in GIFT, the information is, is meaningful when it's used and it's useful. So presentation of the information is very, very important, the quality and the usability of this. So Ben, I am sending it over to you now. Thank you very yeah. much, CB. Uh, we might have more questions for you. If you don't mind, afterwards, we are going to go back to, to this. Yeah, ben. yeah I, I'm going to be very brief. And firstly, I would like to say sorry I couldn't be here yesterday uh, on, on the 22nd. 20. 
Yeah, I was en route. I was coming over to the States to visit one or two family members. But uh, what happened in Liberia, I think we have made tremendous progress when it comes to monitoring SOEs. Uh, firstly, we tried to abide by the law. The law states when you have to produce a report, the quarterly report, the annual report, and all these reports. So what we do as a unit, we try to engage all the SOE individually by communicating with them first as to the deadline, as to when the report is supposed to be produced. So uh, when the deadline is approaching, we send out a communication and then they send a report, we collect the data, we ask them to send the data in Excel uh, to, uh, and they send the data to us and then we collect the data, we populate the data, and then we do our analysis. And a couple of reports that we produce is the quarterly report, the annual financial report, and a budget report. Uh, so we normally collect all this information and then produce the report. So interestingly, when the Minister of Finance have a particular interest in an SOE, he come to us and he said, look, I want you to do an analysis on certain SOE as to the risks that they pose to the government, especially if they intend to borrow money from a private bank to be able to uh, underwrite some of the expenditure costs or so. So he would send that information to me and then we analyze the report and then with a debt management unit at the, at the Ministry of Finance, we coordinate and then see how best we can come out and advise the minister appropriately on the SOE uh, that is producing our report that wants to borrow that money. So we, we normally uh, uh, try to be very transparent in our report. If SOE doesn't produce a report, we go after them. And if they don't want to produce a report, we refer them to the minister and the minister will take up that other issue with them. So what we try to do is to build a relationship with the SOE. So we have a relationship with most of the SOE in terms of trying to submit the report. We don't, we don't go there, we try to explain to them, we're not, S, we're not auditor, we're trying to help them and also help the government. And quite recently, we know some SOEs like the Library and Water Corporation, they engage in, when a new government came in, they engage in a lot of hiring. And we know that the high degree of employees will reduce the physical space within the ministry, within the, when it, what I sue a corporation. So we try, we advise the minister constantly. We advise all the proper authority to take some action. We provide them with the risks that is associated with the company. Right now, if you can see, there's one company like the water and sewer, uh, they can't even meet the salary of the employee for almost two, three months. So, but the action wasn't taken. And that was the problem, you know, so is all a company like me, like we to, I think uh, the Library Telecommunication Corporation also have a similar problem. So we advise the proper authority and then the actions need to be taken. And when you see the reports that you produce, that we produce, you'll know that SOEs, uh, uh, setting SOE has a problem with raising revenue and paying the staff. So we produce a report where we have the balance sheet in the report uh, especially for the annual report, we make sure we have uh, all the ratios in the report. And for the quarterly report, we try to look at the targets as to which SOE is meeting the target and which SOE is not meeting the target. And uh, when it comes to the contribution to the government, we also try to advise the government as to what needs to be done to make sure SOE produce the, uh, uh, the dividend that they require to do because it's passed by law. So normally we, we, we look at a whole range of things, especially when it comes to the budget. We also try to look at the budget too as well. And we advise the minister because the IMF developed uh, uh, a template, a risk analysis template for all. And that's what we use, especially for the budget because the government wants the SOEs to be forthcoming in supporting the budget. And so when, we, when the SOE submitted a report, we do an analysis given a data and given a past history. And then we advise the minister as to how much we think you can get from this SOE. So we'll do all of these things then with the SOE in Liberia. So uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be here yesterday and, and uh, I hope uh, I will be here today and to the next uh, seminar. Maybe I could produce a small uh, presentation for you at the next presentation, at, at, at the next section. Thank you. Excellent, Benedict. Um, it's a, it's a very good report that you're producing on this and uh, this progress is also worth 
thing. So we would be glad to find a slot and make it happen. So I'll contact you by email and we can get that done. And in the meantime, uh, Phoebe has reminded me that the country that he mentioned was Seychelles. He is uh, sharing the link right now on the chat, which is great. We can have different examples of how, how this looks like. And without any, any further uh, discussion on this, I am going to give the floor to Danielle. So a very important part, as we have been discussing, is how we gather information and we have as much transparency as information we have. So how do we gather it? So Danielle, over to you, and she's gonna moderate this second part. Thanks so much, Rena. So yeah, as um, you mentioned in your introductory remarks, we're focusing extensively on information systems in PFM, and we're doing that through a series of online events, research, and once we can travel, in-person events. Um, but so what we're doing is we're providing a platform for practitioners to share and learn from experiences of officials in ministries of finance, who've also conceptualized, implemented, and used information systems. Uh, so more specifically, we're looking into um, capacity and capabilities required for designing and operating an information system. We're looking into contract and contract management. Um, we're looking at the ability of information systems to improve transparency and accountability, which is an area you've come in for us. Um, we're also looking at what big data and artificial intelligence will mean for information systems going forward. Um, a, a range of issues and most relevant for today is some of the motivation for and challenges for extending the institutional coverage of information systems to include subnational government, ministries, departments, agencies, and also state-owned enterprises. And we're looking at this because we obviously know how important it is to have comprehensive coverage of, um, of a country, of all, of all units of government in the public sector. And that it allows us to approach um, public financial management more holistically. It reduces fragmentation in data capturing and analysis. It can also improve information sharing, monitoring and feedback between all parts of the public sector. So, I mean, obviously all great objectives, but it's also very difficult to roll out an information system beyond central government and particularly to state-owned enterprises. It's, that's why so few countries have done it. And um, I'm gonna ask at some stage for Albertina to, to load a poll, just to ask to see how many countries are considering or have already uh, rolled out their information systems to state-owned enterprises. I, my suspicion is that amongst us, only Nigeria has started doing that as we heard on um, Tuesday. But, um, Obviously, this is a complex, offensive, time-consuming exercise. It requires many different administrative units to um, work with the same tools and language, like a standard chart of accounts. It requires strong IT capabilities. So obviously things that don't necessarily always come easy in the public sector. But um, rather than continuing to listen to me, let's hear some um, first-hand accounts from practitioners and um, so first up, we'll have Sheila Tipe, who's Head of Public Finance Statistics at the National Treasury. And um, Sheila will share with us not just about information systems, but also how South Africa has consolidated SOEs and public entities into their national financial statistics. Um, and she'll also touch on the work that the National Treasury has done through Cabri's Building Public Finance Capabilities Program. And that's an action-oriented learning program that we do. And it's centered around the problem-driven iterative adaptation approach. And these um, three teams the National Treasury, we look, which we're looking specifically at public entities and sometimes at state-owned enterprises and tackled issues relating to um, the parallel running of SOEs with the national budget process, uh, data limitations and information asymmetry, specifically around fragmented information systems and limited oversight capabilities by central government and also governance and management challenges in public entities. Um, so after Sheila, we'll hear from Sam, um, Samuel Amenka, who's the technical advisor to the Director General in the Budget Office of the Federation. And Sam, who has provided us with lots of useful information for our case study that we're writing on extending the institutional coverage of the information system. We'll discuss now how the federal government specifically has rolled out 
their gift list to state-owned enterprises, which they actually refer to GOEs, government-owned enterprises. And some of the challenges that have come about with trying to get specifically self-funded entities to utilize the GIFMAS. Um, so before Sheila comes in, I wonder if we can get the results from the panel. I don't know how well it's gonna work. Yesterday I was quite impressed. So let's see. We're still missing some votes. So we have few votes. So please, the ones we're missing, if you can let us know. Okay, so let's hear first from Sheila and then the others can vote in the poll. It's just really to get an idea of our countries thinking about extending the um, IFMAS to SOEs, if you've already done it, just so we can get a discussion going and then we can hear from particular voices. Uh, so we have 57% um, who are saying that they have rolled out the IFMAS to um, SOEs, but only some. So, and then, um, other people who said, good question, I do not know. Um, so probably worth finding out in your country. But um, maybe for those who have said that they have rolled out already, other than Nigeria, after we hear from Sam, we can hear from some of you if you don't mind. So um, Sheila, over to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. As already been said, my name is Sheila Chip. I work for the National Treasury Budget Office uh, in South Africa. Um, taking care of public finance statistics. So I've prepared a short presentation on what we have consolidated and what we have not consolidated and what um, the, the future thinking is around um, public entities in general. So I'm gonna try and share my presentation. I hope I can share. This one. Um, is it visible? Yep, just if you want to put it in presentation mode, just to make it bigger. Mode. Great. Right. Okay, so I'm just going to present on the consolidation of public entities. Uh, into the main budget uh, process by South Africa, a process that started around 2002, 2003. Uh, so the outline is just why did we decide to consolidate these uh, public entities and which public sector units are we consolidating and what we had to contend with and how we resolve the issues that arose when we tried to do that. And then uh, also look at uh, state-owned companies, a different case, uh, because we, we look at those separate from the rest and then uh, what the future holds. So straight to it, uh, why did we consolidate? Because uh, public entities, uh, which are classified as government, make up, take up about uh, a, between 10 and 15% of government revenue every year. So that's quite a big chunk of the revenue going to them. Um, and uh, that revenue needs to be tracked. We need to, to know how it is being spent and um, uh, bringing them in also allows us to see uh, what, what, what they keep and um, their own generated income as well, vis-a-vis -vis what gets transferred from the fiscus. And uh, it allows us to, to, to be able to know, uh, for example, if we need to consolidate the, 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 the spending, we need to, to do a consolidated fiscal stance, then we know uh, which entities we can take from and which ones we, we, we need to beef up. Um, so they, they are also a very important vehicles of service delivery. For example, in our water and transport sectors, um, the delivery of services is not done by the department, it's done by um, the public entities that are affiliated or uh, report to, to the department. So the department is really policy making uh, and then the public entities are the ones that deliver on the services. For example, the uh, roads agency, our road agency, and then we have the water trading entity. Um, so the, and, uh, um, some entities that then build infrastructure and, and actually deliver on, on those uh, things. Then 
Uh, it also gives us a better measure of government's uh, interaction with the rest of the economy, because without these entities' activities, uh, because remember, we are saying 15% of revenue from government, but they also, some of them are raising their own revenue. So when it comes to the spending side, you might you find that uh, the percentage might be higher because then they also are spending from their own uh, sourced revenues. Uh, so it gives a better measure of, of the size of, of government per se, when we use uh, the spending level and the revenue level at consolidated level as a proxy for the size, size of government, it gives a better uh, measurement. And then also importantly, the management of assets and liabilities it, it, at the least become better aware of what is happening. So those were the driving factors for us to want to consolidate. Uh, and then um, which entities are currently consolidated? Uh, we have classified our public entities uh, into two groups, uh, the general government uh, units and the wider public sector units, which are the financial and non-financial uh, public entities, which are quasi or business units. Uh, so we consolidate the ones that are classified as general government because with the ways they are seen as part of general government in the GFS uh, manual. So that's, that's, that's our aim from 2003 was to make sure that all of those that are classified as general government are integrated in the process. Uh, so that's what, um, that, that's what we do. And then uh, a few falling out of general government also get consolidated, especially those that uh, deliver infrastructure um, uh, services, infrastructure uh, projects. Um, they, we consolidate them because they receive a very big chunk of our capital transfers where they have their own, like some, one like Sandra, which is the road agency, they have their own um, uh, uh, infrastructure development, which is uh, in their own revenue space where they charge um, a user fee for using the roads. And then there are the national roads, which uh, because they have capacity to deliver. So we transfer money for the national roads to them as well. So because of that, uh, they get consolidated in the accounts. Uh, so what issues did we have to resolve before we're able to consolidate? So the legal framework. Um, so we have um, the PFMA, uh, but the PFMA was not, is not very strong on making public entities. Uh, report to the national treasury. So, but we have in the PFMA a, a, some sort of sunset clause, something that allows us to issue an instruction. Uh, so we we have through the the the, the budgeting uh, framework that we have, um, we had to contend with that. We did not, for example, on the reporting side, they are compelled to report to the executive authorities, but not necessarily to the treasury. Uh, so we had to use uh, that uh, clause that allow us uh, to ask for anything from anyone in the public sector and to develop an instruction for them to be able to report to the treasury. Uh, but on the budgeting side, they are expected to report uh, at least uh, six months for those that are not considered business and uh, one month for those that are considered business report they submit their budgets to the executive authority or to the treasuries is they've been um, instructed then on, then there's also the enabling acts some of these public entities have got enabling acts so the enabling acts uh, sort of um, then say to them, this is how you're gonna function, this is who you're gonna report to and so on. So we had to also work through those and see how we can uh, work through that barrier of having a separate enabling act, which is not in the, which is operating independent of the PFMA. And then the other big issue was the difference of uh, accounting basis because the, the, the general government is on cash basis of accounting still, we are now, um, Moving slowly towards approvals, we are in the adjust in the in the modified cash basis of accounting. 
Um, but then at that point, we were really cash and then visas accrual. And we had to then say, how are we going to make sure that we are able to consolidate these, these uh, accounts? Because the, the one is uh, recording when cash flows and the other one is recording when there's an economic flow. So then we had to deal with that. And then also different governance structures and misalignment in terms of that, because of the different governance structures, they already had structures about when they should do their budgets and who, when they should, when the boards should, um, um, what is called, authorize those and approve those budgets and so on. And then the process being misaligned to the general uh, budgeting process that we have. Um, and then obviously the, the public entities they are not on the basic accounting system of government. They, each public entity has got its own accounting uh, system, its own procurement system, its own personnel system. Even today, it's still like that. Uh, there is no central point where you can go and access the information as treasury officials. We have to rely on asking for them to submit the information. So that's one of the barriers that are there. And then how did we resolve some of the issues? Uh, we, inst we issue uh, instructions and guidelines for submission uh, for both budgeting and reporting information. And we collaborate with uh, other units in government uh, or who are independent of government in, in technical terms, like the Auditor General and the Accountant General. Uh, so we collaborate with them in trying to ensure that uh, there is, there is uh, alignment and the instructions make sense to them. The entities will be able to deal with those. And then we also um, use the cash flow. So to deal with the, with the different accounting uh, basis, of, basis of accounting, we decided to use the, the cash flow. In the beginning, they were using the indirect method of cash flow. So we had to do some conversions from the cash, from the cash uh, accrual numbers. Uh, using uh, information from the cash flow to try and take it to a proxy of cash data for the public entities for us to be able to bring them in. But that in itself was also posing some challenges in some of the lines, because some of the lines would not then be uh, exactly what they should be. They would be quite maybe far from what the actual uh, cash that has gone through is. So in, I think in 2010, the accountant general issued that they should now use the direct method of the cash flow, which then made it better for us because then we have the operating account and the uh, capital account and you can see the, the line items, how they are, they, are, they are established. So it improved the data quite a bit. So we, we are still using that uh, cash flow data with some adjustments where it's necessary um, to estimate uh, the, the cash numbers that then get consolidated. And then we also provided for a mapping of the accounting systems to the economic reporting format. The economic reporting format is uh, based on uh, the GFS uh, with uh, a little bit of adjustments for uh, South Africa's environment. Uh, one such as is, is, for example, is that we don't uh, distribute transfers as grants and other transfers. We just distribute them according to who is receiving the transfer. Uh, so uh, that's what the economic reporting format is, but it has uh, the GFS classifications like goods and services, uh, conversation of employees and so on. So we did a mapping between the financial uh, information of the public entities with uh, the, the economic reporting format so that then they can embed that into their systems and draw the information as when we, we need it. Uh, then we also kept the collecting collection tool uh, comprehensive but stable, meaning that we did not make we don't we try we try to make it as comprehensive in the beginning so that there are no changes as we go on, too many changes, uh, because then it makes it difficult to even build a, a time series or even uh, the entities themselves would be fatigued if you keep changing things all the time. So we have kept it uh, quite uh, stable, a few changes here and there, but it's quite stable. The main, the main uh, 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 
backbone is still the same. So uh, that's, that's, that works better, wait well. And then we work closely, with, as I said before, with the accounting general to ensure that the estimates of the data uh, are, are correct because they are the experts in, in, the, in, the, in the accounting framework. And then we also have uh, consultations. As we went on, we got introduced to PDIA and we started having more, uh, whenever we're introducing a reform, we started having more consultations with the stakeholders, which is the public entities in this regard. So when we built the quarterly reporting system, which came after the budgeting uh, system, we uh, involved them more uh, in what the, the framework should look like, what the system should look like, so that when we collect that information, uh, we are in agreement as to what should, what should happen. And also that system also has a mapping that happens. So all they do is to uh, update their, their um, their their accounts um, and then they they dump on the on the on the system and then it does the mapping and we draw that information from that so that's how we dealt with that and then in terms of state owned companies so the ones that are not general government uh, they are a different case uh, because even at that time in 2003 we do not think to consolidate them. Uh, we, we saw it as a long-term project for uh, the consolidation into the public sector accounts, which then involves everybody else. So these SOCs were set up as surplus generating units. So they are basically they are business units. So they are not government units. Uh, they were never meant to be part of the general government. They were never meant to be part of the budgeting process. Um, however, they have uh, government guaranteed debt. Uh, so they've always had that government guaranteed date and there's a unit in the treasury called the assets and liabilities management unit, which then was uh, looking after them, issuing the, 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 the guarantees and tracking those that have got guarantees. But there was no link between that process and the main budget process. So in this side, in the budget office, uh, we're aware that there is uh, a contingent uh, liability in the, in the system, uh, which is uh, the guarantees that are, are given to state-owned companies when they borrow, but we're not linking it to the budget process, even though the guarantee, if it's called, will affect the, 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 the budget process. However, in recent years, we, we have seen a growing list of requests from uh, the state-owned companies asking for uh, bailouts, um, uh, recapitalizations, or um, uh, budget support. Uh, so in recent years, there is a fiscal risk um, report that happens every quarter. It is managed by fiscal uh, policy unit within the budget office, but it involves the asset and liabilities management people, the economic, uh, the macroeconomic uh, unit uh, people, everyone who has an interest in, in this, uh, um, uh, the, the, the fiscal risk. So every quarter there is uh, a, a report that gets uh, reported and everyone who is involved, we sit around the table and we discuss where the risk, risks are. And, um, um, but some of them obviously have realized already but uh, there is a, a tool that they are using. I'm not sure, I've never seen the tool, I've only seen the report, uh, where the report uh, and not uh, is in the exact same format is uh, what uh, Mr. Uh, he, is it Hida was, was presenting, uh, but I think uh, we will link uh, the fiscal uh, policy guys to you. Uh, so that maybe they can look at uh, the tool that IMF has developed and see how it can enhance uh, the fiscal report. The fiscal report uh, itself is included now in the in the budget documentation. But uh, again, as uh, uh, the presenter was presenting, I was thinking maybe putting it in the budget documentation is not uh, transparent enough. Maybe it should be published independently so that it's louder. Uh, and it's seen as a, as a regular um, publication that 
people don't have to search through the, the, the budget reports. But I think Keta and, and the team that does this will be very interested in this uh, health tool. So in terms of state-owned companies, so that's where we are. There is a balance analysis that happens with the fiscal risk and they analyze the date, uh, they analyze the, the ratios and see where, who is where and, and what's happening. Um, so even the social security funds that have got issues are also included in this fiscal risk report. Um, then obviously the consolidations for state-owned companies can happen in the general government account. It will only happen if we do a consolidation at public sector level. And then in the future, while well, we are developing a single, we are thinking of developing a single score for entities in preparation for a single um, financial management system. Uh, it's still a thought, but it's getting louder uh, because of the issues that we're having with uh, public entities. Uh, recently, as I said earlier, that we, we, were expo we have been exposed to the PDIA process by CABRI. Uh, we had earlier um, projects which had nothing to do with this, but now we're using the, the same uh, uh, approach uh, to do budget reform for public entities. And we are involving the public entities themselves and the oversight units. So uh, we have got three uh, um, lines which we are dealing with, uh, the, the three uh, problems that we need to solve. One is the oversight, where the role of oversight units, strengthening oversight units. So we find that each department now has got an oversight unit for entities that never used to be, but now uh, each department that has public entities has got an oversight unit, but some of them are doing very well. They have set up systems, they are tracking their, their entities and they're making sure that they are involved in the budgeting processes and reporting processes of entities, but some are weak. They are not doing any of that. Uh, so part of it is that we must solve that problem of strengthening the oversight over the, the entities at executive level and then the things then coming to the center at treasury where, as I mentioned, that each entity has got its own systems, accounting systems, procurement systems, uh, and, and it's difficult for you to then collect all that information because even now we try to say, can we have information on your personnel uh, data? It's very difficult because we cannot even come up with a single uh, way of saying, okay, submit the data like this. Because when you say, you try to solve this one's problem, the other one is like, well, I can't report like that because that's not how my system looks like. So that's just personnel. We haven't even gone to the procurement system. So that's that's one of the, of the problems that we are going to try and, and solve. And then also the planning and budgeting, how do we then uh, align and, and how do we, bring them apart from just submitting the budgets now to really participate in the budget process. So those three um, aspects that we're dealing with have got uh, focus groups that we have set up, which, in, which include the oversight unit people from the departments and public some public entities and then national treasury officials to form focus group on each of those to come up with with uh, the solutions using the problem-driven iterative adaptation process, uh, which is uh, it has become very uh, uh, popular with us because it's a very adaptable and flexible way of solving problems. So we really like it at Treasury. <laughs> Anybody who has been exposed to it likes it. So that's why maybe there are more projects that we are using this approach to, to try and resolve uh, this. So, the inclusion part of the process is also to say, how do we include the SOCs in the main budget process? So for now, we include them whenever they have uh, a request. So now we are now including them in the MTEC process, uh, the MTEC process where we discuss and we do the trade-offs. They are now slowly being incorporated to say that uh, whatever you're requesting must compete with the rest of the government priorities but that's the beginning. We'll see how, what happens in the future. Uh, thank you. I think that's the end of my presentation.
Thank Thanks you. so much, Sheila. I think that was very comprehensive and useful for us all. And um, we do have a question from, I think you say your name is Aura. Um, Aura, do you want to ask your question live? Yeah, right. I, I was just very interested in the in the format that you were speaking about, that it sounded like a translation tool for translating accounting from SE, SOEs to the treasury accounting style uh, or formats. So I wonder if that translation per se is public or and if both entities, the S, SOEs and the treasury publish by themselves uh, independently their accounting. I, I just was wondering because it could be confusing if you see both, but if you see just one, how do you keep track from how it started in the SOE and now how it's it's consolidated with, with this tool. I found it very interesting. Okay, so the, the tool, which we call the consolidation tool, um, it you could see it as public or not public because uh, the, the collection tool has that conversion in, embedded in it, but the entities don't necessarily see uh, that part. They just see their account, their cash flows and what even other. Then when when we are working, we just un, 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 unhide that that sheet that then gives us the information in the cash basis. So, but uh, now the difference is not that big because we are using the direct cash method. So the difference then will be that we are going to bring in the, the deferred income and we bring it up and then we're going to bring in the capital uh, spending and bring it up so that it then becomes uh, the cash the cash account. Uh, but uh, so they've seen it, some of them, when they unhide, then they see and say, oh, okay, this is what you do. And we've, in our presentations, we've shown them that this is what we do with your information to end up with, with the cash basis of accounting. And it's important to show them. So it's for them, they, they have seen that because when we are now querying the information, for example, when we are now uh, bringing these things together and we need to find out, we'll be asking about that cash information. So they have to know about it, which is why we changed and say this conversion story is very complicated because when the minute you start to say to them, we converted, then they're like, uh -uh, this is not our information. We are not answering any question because we don't know what you're talking about. But now that most of the information is not a conversion, it's just bringing some aspect, some uh, account, some uh, parts of the cash flow into the operating up above the line. So they can see it's above the line, but it's still the numbers that we gave you. Uh, so, but when we send it to them, the consolidation sheet is not open, it's, it's locked. <laughs> they might change the formulas if you leave it open as well. So yeah, but they are aware of it. Thanks, Sheila. So if I can quickly ask you just one last question, um, just to go into the quality of data you receive from public entities. So I know that you had a massive workshop with public entities as part of the PDIA program. And there they've sort of provided you with feedback in terms of their reporting and how they see the capacity in the oversight units. So can you just provide us a little bit more insight into the sort of challenges that in, um, that these public entities said they face in reporting? And then we'll move to Sam. Yes. Thanks so much. I think um, the quality of the information is always uh, something that you have to work with. So um, when, they, when they submit the information, they give you, especially on the budgeting side, on the history side, at least we have the uh, audited financial statements to as, as, a, as a verification tool. So that one is fine, but on the we find that most of the time in the in year, uh, because there's always there are always budget games about retaining your your earnings and so on. So they might inflate some of their spending and so on. But we use the historic information to always fix that and and say to them, well, based on your historic spending and where you are now, because now we have the quarterly reporting. So when we do the budget we'll be having uh, uh, three months, uh, three quarters data. So we can go there and say, but this is where you are. How are you going to be able to, to do this? Um, so the entities themselves, they felt they, there was a lot of outcry about the systems 
that we need to at least have an integration. Uh, we need to be provided with an integration tool uh, that integrates our systems with, 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 with yours. Uh, there were also a, an outcry about that uh, some of the oversight units, they really don't do anything with the data that they receive from the entities. They do not engage with it. They do not report back on, on anything. They don't query anything. So the entities start feeling like, but why must we comply? So they do, they did admit that we sometimes do malicious compliance because we know uh, they are not gonna do anything with the information. So we can submit and then we tick the box, it's submitted. Uh, so th those are the issues that they, they have. That's, that's why we're trying, that's why we ended up with those three lines that say the, the oversight strengthening the systems and the budgeting. They, they also felt, um, that they are mis being misrepresented in the budget process. They felt that the executive authorities, which is the ministries, they don't really uh, present what they would have presented to them when it comes to the MTEC process, the medium term uh, expenditure uh, committee processes. Uh, they are just, give, they would like, especially the big entities, they would like to be able to come also and present to Treasury uh, about what they are doing and, and participate in the process, which was actually surprising for us because we would have thought that they are not interested in doing that, but uh, they, they say they want to do, to do that. So yeah, so the, the issues that were raised, uh, what made us end up with having those three um, problems that we say we are going to have to solve. I think it's a hugely important lesson for all countries that you can't assume that public entities want or don't want a specific system or don't want to be involved. You actually have to understand their perspective and the challenges they're facing. Um, and let's now head to Sam. Um, he can share with us how they went about actually incorporating government owned entities into the GIFMAS. So Sam from the budget office in Nigeria, um, if you can come in now, thanks so much. And thank you, Sheila, that was really useful. All right, uh, thank you, Danielle. And um, uh, thank you, Sheila, for the presentation. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Let me quickly share my screen. And um, one minute. Uh, one minute. So while Sam's getting ready, if there's any questions um, as he goes along, please post in the chat box. We'll try to get to them. Um, we, we've got about 15 minutes left. Thanks so much. Sam, are you having difficulties? We could see your presentation very well. Yeah, and give Sam a minute or two and we can carry on. Sam, do you want to provide us an update? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, Danielle. Uh, I've just yeah. emailed it. If you could just help me share and then sure. make sense. No no. My network okay. has been coming up, so. Uh, no problem. I'll get it quickly. Maybe in the meanwhile, you can just. Um, yes, I'll just go ahead. OK, just and just maybe just provide some context. All right, so um, so thank you, thank you very much. I, I know I was here on um, Tuesday, 
and um, I, I, I listen out to Genica's, you know, talk about progress we've made. What I'm going to be doing really today is to spend the next few minutes to talk about the rationale, you know, why we felt the need to uh, uh, extend the institutional coverage of uh, GIFMIS to SOEs. I'll also speak more on the progress, you know, um, adding more to what, you know, Genica spoke about on Tuesday. I'll talk about the challenges and some of the things that we have done, um, you know, how we address, you know, those, those challenges and um, what we're looking at, you know, as to the future. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing this. So I, I'd like to provide a bit of background, you know, in terms of um, how we all start, how we started and, you know, where we are. So it was in 2019, when uh, 2009 rather, April, when the Nigerian government launched uh, GIFMIS. And this was as part of its efforts to institutionalize fiscal transparency uh, and then, you know, anti-corruption in the budget process. Uh, you know, prior to that time, um, we traditionally used to prepare our budgets using Excel. And um, even though execution had been a bit different, but in terms of preparation and execution, it, it was a bit more uh, crude than what we currently have using uh, GIFMIS. So um, with the increasing need for uh, more transparency, uh, the budget preparation subsystem was activated, you know, and it was utilized for uh, budget preparations by MDAs. And I would like to make a distinction, you know, more broadly, when we talk about um, SOEs, it's all inclusive. We think more of public corporations. So whether they are just core spending MDAs of government or they are necessarily, um, you know, uh, corporations of government that, you know, that manages government access, you know, deliver some services and make profits, okay, and remit, you know, some of those profits uh, uh, to government. So um, even though um, I, I acknowledge that there have been increasing efforts to integrate SOEs in GIFMIS uh, since 2016, uh, it was only in 2020, you know, that we gained uh, traction that's uh, uh, this year. But, um, but that's not all. Um, what we have tried to do as a precursor to that was to see how we could integrate the SOEs budget as part of the you know, general budget of the federal uh, government. And um, if you could turn to the next slide, uh, some of the reasons behind why we, you know, we made the big push for that was the need to improve uh, remittances you know, um, of the SOEs. Um, for some of you who may recall, in 2016, uh, Nigeria slipped into a recession, and that was due to the decline in the price of oil from mid-2014, um, that was sometime in June. Uh, consequently, the Nigerian government started to implement a number of initiatives to improve non-oil revenues. There was a kind of a shift to, you know, to improve non-oil revenues, and, and one of you know, the initiative was to take seriously the fiscal operations of SOEs. Uh, this was a measure to move the country away from the dependence on, you know, on oil and also to speed up, you know, economic uh, recovery. Uh, in Nigeria, SOEs account for about uh, 40 trillion Naira in terms of their valuation. Uh, that's about um, 105 uh, billion US dollar. Um, but remittances, Remittances have been, you know, um, uh, under 10 percent. Remittances of operating surplus have been, you know, under 10 percent annually. Now, uh, there was also the need to enhance, you know, uh, monitoring and evaluation of fiscal operations of the SOEs and uh, increase performance of SOEs, you know, in terms of upping their, in terms of upping their efficiency in service in service delivery. Um, one of the things we also observed was the need to subject SOEs to the same level of scrutiny as other um, ministry departments and agencies of government. I make this distinction between the MDAs and the SOEs in the sense that uh, in Nigeria, we classify the 
um, some of those public corporations or entities or agencies that necessarily do not generate profits or um, revenues from the activities as MDAs. Okay, why those who um, whose activities you know um, lead to some uh, profit generation as as SOEs. So, and one of the things we observed was that um, those SOEs, because we do not pay much attention to them, we also do not scrutinize their fiscal operations, and that undermines uh, to a very large extent the um, remittances of um, operating surplus to to the treasury. Uh, and we've seen cases where some of them actually do operate outside their core mandates, uh, you know, thereby increasing their, their costs. Uh, one other reason why, you know, this was a very big issue for government was uh, the need to, you know, increase or emphasize revenue. Uh, for so long, the expenditure side of the budget had dominated discussions on the federal government's budget, and um, it impaired the focus on resource mobilization and, um, and, and uh, revenue reporting particularly for those that you know uh, that do business on behalf of, of of government so that was one reason again why we felt the need to onboard soes on on gifmes um again um there have been cases where soes declared you know significant losses and are unable to you know adequately finance their operations um we expect that integrating SOEs on GIFMIS, you know, and the federal government's budget, you know, will, you know, help minimize, you know, those associated risks that, you know, fall out from the fiscal operations of, of the SOEs. Now, all of all these, you know, country specific uh, rationales, you know, really are subs of the more general global cause for, you know, greater fiscal transparency, comprehensiveness and, and accountability. Uh, for which, you know, uh, even Nigeria as a country um, signed on to. If you take a look at the charts which are dropped there, um, the, the, the top chart actually um, just shows you, uh, could you open it up a bit? Could you, um, if, you if you could just, yeah, no, 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 if you, yeah, yeah, thank you. It still needs to move to the right. So it just shows you um, the share of um, revenue, you know, between um, oil, non-oil, and the independent revenue. Please help me shrink it a bit so you could see. Um, yes. So I mean, there's 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 a line by the side. Okay. Anyway, what what you what you what the story there is? If you look at the gray, the gray bar. The gray bar is reflective of um, federal government independent revenue. And really, um, what that represents is the operating surpluses of, or the revenue generated by SOEs. Now, out of, so the, the, the SOEs generally contribute up to 80% of the um, independent revenues you see on the grid bar. So, which goes on to tell you that in, in terms of their contributions to the general pool of revenue, it's been um, uh, very uh, negligible. And that's because um, uh, much attention has not been paid with respect to um, their uh, fiscal operations. Now, the, the, the chart below, which speaks of the independent um, uh, revenue, um, could you just push it up a bit? shows you the level of deviation between um, the, the projected uh, independent revenue of government and uh, the actuals. Um, Daniel? Yes, sir. I know the chat. I know the, the chats are kind of small, but if you could move. They, they, they were a good the size on my side, side but. Um... Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, the story there really shows that since 2016, uh, we have seen increases or improvements in the performance of um, independent revenue, for which the operating surpluses of uh, SOEs are a major, you know, share, has a major share. Um, uh, and so that actually has stemmed from some of the uh, reforms we have put in place to ensure that uh, SOEs are held more and more, more accountable. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so with respect to um, the progress you know, we have made, I would like to dimension it based on um, our approach, um, which, which we faced you know, in terms of expanding this coverage to, to SOEs. We adopted a phased approach in order to you know, adopt this or adapt the functionalities to the information flows, which we understand were quite different from the, you know, the budgeting framework of SOEs and those of the, um, of the uh, typical MDAs of, of government. So in 2019, what we did was to identify um, 10 major SOEs, okay, with respect to their revenue and expenditure, and then we captured them on the medium-term expenditure framework of government. And then on the aggregate in the federal government. Done this year is to extend or to increase the number to, to 60. And that's a significant number of SOEs in Nigeria that are you know, either partially uh, funded or self-funded. Uh, we, we don't have much problems with, you know, or any problems really in terms of um, SOEs that are you know, fully funded by, by government. Uh, so what our goal has been in recent time has to you know, capture uh, those, those SOEs that are partially or self-funded. Um, and, and, and that's what we did you know, this year ahead of 2021 um, budget. Uh, if you recall, um, in, when Ginika spoke on Tuesday, she categorized, and that's the categorization we have you know, for SOEs in Nigeria. We class them as those that are fully funded, those that are partially funded, that is they receive uh, one or more you know, uh, subventions from, from the federal budget and those that are you know self self-funded uh, we've gone ahead to ensure that all soe's budgets are incorporated in the federal budget so whether um, the soe is fully funded whether it's partially funded or whether it is self-funded they are now a, a part of the um, um, federal government uh, budget and um, one of the things we have done differently you know uh, in the past we have some of these SOEs that submit their budgets to us, okay? Um, we, 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 we take their numbers, and then with those numbers, we're able to project the operating surplus that will be remitted to Treasury, which forms part of the independent revenue of government. However, um, these SOEs, you know, submit their budgets to their respective um, uh, committees that oversight them at the parliament. And so what they do is that they send us a different budget and take a different budget to parliament. And um, that um, significantly affects some of the projections we've made for, you know, for independent revenue. So one of the things that we have been able to get is to secure the buy-in of parliament to ensure that only the uh, budget that has you know, come through us and that is submitted by the president you know, is um, is considered and approved by, by parliament. So we, we don't have the variations that we used to have uh, in the past. And, um, uh, and then the other thing we have done differently is also to modify the appropriation bill formats, okay, to include revenue projections and expenditures estimates of the SOEs. Now, uh, uh, in the past, our appropriation bill focused more on the expenditure estimate of uh, MDAs spending MDAs, but what we've done now is to expand it to include um, even the revenue and expenditure estimates of, of SOEs, so they are held more, more accountable. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so with respect to some of the challenges that um, have undermined, you know, our, our progress, um, I'll focus on two key ones. Um, so there are acts that establishes some of these SOEs, you know, and these acts define their financial relationship with government, you know, uh, so there have been very little incentives, you know, more or less, you know, some resistance to utilize GIFMIS, which, you know, since some of these SOEs don't draw uh, from the consolidated revenue funds of government. So the relationship between the government budget and the activities of the SOEs, you know, 
have been reduced more to just operating surplus. So oversight, uh, monitoring physical operations, activities of this SOE had been you know, uh, really, really difficult. So even with the provisions of the Fiscal Responsibility Act 2007, uh, most SOE is still recourse to their respective you know, enabling acts. So it was now difficult you know, in the past to, to get them committed to preparing their bu uh, budget using GIFMIS or onboarding them on that platform. Uh, so what we did um, this time was to you know, um, get authorization from the president. In fact, it was the presidency that issued you know, an order you know, mandating that SOEs, um, you know, move to the GIFMIS platform. But what we are trying to do is to graduate them in phases. Um, since we know that all that are fully funded, you know, already prepared a budget using GIFMIS, we decided to phase those who are partially funded onto the GIFMIS platform. And, and I'll speak to the reason why, you know, we had to, you know, adopt that approach when we look at the, at, at the second challenge. Now, um, Again, one of the reasons why there had been very strong resistance is because the Fiscal Responsibility Act, you know, stipulates that um, SOEs should remit 80% of their operating surplus to Treasury, okay? And what we, what we saw in the past was that SOEs then had um, a lot of liberty to increase their revenue and their expenditure. So raising their costs, you know, tend to reduce the operating surplus of, of these agencies. So what government decided to do was to then say, you know what, um, zone remit 80% of your operating surplus, remit 25% of your gross revenue. Then we began to see an understatement of, you know, revenues. And, um, you know, government was not still able to achieve, you know, uh, its, you know, its target of improving, you know, the operations and the remittances from the SOE. So what, what it did um, last year, and we are we're still implementing in the medium term, is to limit the, 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 uh, the cost to revenue ratio of SOEs to not more than 60%. So um, irrespective of whatever you want to project as your revenue, you cannot spend more than 60% of your revenue. Uh, that, that creates you know, a more like, um, uh, limits the you know the the window for mischief by some of these um, SOEs that also um, we did, and it becomes easier for us because having prepared their budget, especially for those that are you know partially funded on GIFMIS, and having that same budget transmitted to Parliament, it becomes easy to track you know uh, the activities and the operations of these of these SOEs. It was. It becomes easy to um, to scrutinize their operations, and then the T and the TSA also helps when when it comes to the the, the part of the of the implementation. Now, one Sam, of the challenges that we, we are going to have to wrap up, so just run through the last challenge quickly, and then we're going to have to close. Thanks so much. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you very much. So the the other challenge that we had was implementing the change order requests. Okay, uh, and that's. Um, came up because um, the SOEs had very different, you know, accounting framework compared to uh, the chart of accounts we had on GIFMIS. And, and so what we tried to do then was to, was to limit the, you know, the rollover of, or yeah, the, the, the expansion of GIFMIS to these SOEs to those that are already, um, that are already partially funded by government. And because the implication of that is that there were some Exemplar some close relationship between the way they operate their own budget and um, the functionalities that we had on 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 GIFMIS. There is still a major challenge that we have, which we will still find a way to resolve, which is how to treat those agencies that are on first line charge that are not, you know, uh, currently on GIFMIS. For instance, the you know the budget of the parliament and some other um, um, executive bodies are not uh, on on GIFMIS. In terms of looking forward. Um, what we are planning to do um, next year in the next budget cycle is to now include um, those SOEs that are um, self-funded and uh, into the into the GIFMIS uh, platform, and then to also gradually activate the M and E subsystems of GIFMIS 
you know, just so that we are able to uh, improve our monitoring evolution evaluation um, framework. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, Lorena, do you want to tell us? I think we probably need to wrap up. I know we're already over time. I, I think I'm asking Albertina if we can uh, maybe take one question and we can wrap up. I, I don't know if there are any questions. I haven't seen any. There, doesn't, there aren't any in the chat, so we may be able to wrap up anyway. Okay. Okay. So from my side, I would actually want to know from from uh, from Sam if if um, now that they're using the GIFMES, if they're using the same calendar for reporting the whole of government. So that is something important. Of, or if they have special periods, maybe you can share that um, in a chat, or we can say, we can keep going during the next session. So as we figure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Me yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the, the good thing about, you know, um, uh, moving on to GIFMIS is that it's helping us have a unified budget calendar for both the, for all spending, you know, ag agencies of government, for all SOEs, uh, unlike what you used to have in the past. I, I hope that answers your question because traditionally, um, I hope I'm getting that right, but traditionally what we used to have is that when SOEs go to parliament to submit their budget, they go at different timelines. And so they are usually different um, um, start and end time for all of these um, uh, SOEs and then the federal government's budget. But now we just have one timeline and everything runs from January to December. Okay, and given that we have been working as, as part of this fiscal openness accelerator and how this is going to be integrated in the reports, do you have this uh, like already the, the plan on how to integrate this as part of all the our eight key budget documents or is this still an ongoing process it is still an ongoing process because um we we know what you know challenges are th there are and um, they are huge and uh, uh, the reality is that we just take it a step at a time which makes sense it's not easy task uh, to consolidate for the first time and hopefully doing it from with a drift miss from the start will make it easier in the longer run. I don't know, Danielle, if you wanted to say something. Yeah. Um, no, I think Sam covered things quite comprehensively. Um, and I'm going to hand back to you. Thanks so much for giving us this time. And thank you, Sam, for your really useful interventions. And Sheila, um, over to you, Lorena. Thanks. Thank you, Danielle. It's always a uh, great working with with you and with Kavri on this. Uh, there's a lot of work to do on on financial management information systems. Some something we don't usually or we were not usually talking about before when we were only speaking about transparency. It was only about the reports, but um, there's a limit. Your reports are going to be as good as the information that you get. And uh, systems then have a very, very, very important role on fiscal transparency. And some of what you're highlighting, what um, Sheila was mentioning on how to get the information through templates and these Excel spreadsheets that do the bridge and so forth. So it, it gives us a lot of challenges for consolidation. And then this is a challenge for transparency. So um, I think we can uh, wrap up now. I see Juan Pablo here uh, wants to, to give us a message. Just a reminder that we have another session next Thursday that we're going to focus on guarantees. And we're going to also have a presentation of a new fiscal stress test for SOS in COVID times, which brings a peculiar um, Actually, again, and crystallization of contingency. So we have to discuss this as well. So we're going to see you next Thursday. Thank you all. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, CB, uh, very much. And Juan Pablo, over to you. Thank you all. And remember, we have been recording these sessions, and they will soon be at the GIFT uh, YouTube channel. If you want to go into detail or if so, for some reason you can stay throughout the session, you can see the recording. 
Thank you and see you soon. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you all. Thank you. See, you. Bye. see you next week. <laughs> we haven't finished discussing all this. <laughs> Bye. Yes, yes actually. Bye. <laughs> yeah, let's just say. Ok, Juan, nous on était encore là, hein? tout le ministère était encore là. <rire> C'est très gentil de votre part, je vous en remercie beaucoup, vous êtes les bienvenus. On va foncer sur le travail et la collaboration ensemble. Ça c'est sûr. À la semaine prochaine, au revoir. D'accord, la semaine prochaine. Lorena, Bertina, bye bye. Ciao, Charlie. Thank you very much uh, for the translation. Um, we were going over time, but it was one of the principal ones. We didn't want to, yeah, it was difficult to cut that one.